so welcome to the session again this is the second session we will have with us dr leo signal uh, i didn't quite complete his introduction last time so uh, let me give it to you in more detail he is a phd from the california institute of technology and since then has been working at nasa goddard uh, he is one of the key people around the world in the electromagnetic follow up of gravitational waves and he is also uh, probably the best python programmer in astronomy all around the world so uh, some of the modules that you people are using are actually written by you and it's not just you it's professional astronomers around the world who are uh, using those modules so with that uh, we'll, i'll hand it over to leo again we have a 30 minute lecture first and then we'll switch to the new notebook which has been handed out to you. Uh, all of this material all notebooks will later be put online on the winter school website so that uh, if you are if people who are watching us online if you need to download these later they will all be available for you leo thank you very much for that uh, <laughs> very kind introduction we'll start this session with a half hour long lecture that will uh, in which i'll talk about uh, cross-matching gravi uh, gravitational wave localizations with galaxy catalogs so this will be um, a, a little bit more technical in nature than um, our first um, lecture by Professor Kozlowal, um, but it'll be, uh, but we won't get into the actual uh, nitty-gritty details of the Python until the second part of this session. Okay, so I'll just start out with some fundamentals about how we do uh, localization with gravitational wave observations. So uh, we have, uh, we started out with uh, three advanced ground-based gravitational wave detectors. Advanced uh, means that they, um, they embody a series of, of hardware upgrades that brought them from uh, the sensitivity that, uh, that, that uh, LIGO and Virgo had when they were initially built um, to a sensitivity where uh, they actually can detect astrophysical sources. And these are all uh, kilometer scale gravitational wave detectors. Uh, we have the LIGO Hanford detector in uh, Washington State in the middle of a nuclear wasteland, LIGO Livingston in the middle of a swamp in Louisiana, and uh, Virgo, uh, which is just outside, uh, which is in uh, Cashina, just outside Pisa, Italy. I've never been there, but there doesn't seem to be anything particularly wrong with that place, and so I don't know if they were just not creative enough to put it in some really unpleasant place. But um, so. Of course, uh, uh, there is a, a new detector being com commissioned in uh, Japan called Kagra. It's in the Kamioka mine, which is the same uh, facility that contains the Super Kamiokande detector. And as uh, Professor Kozlowal described it, it is subterranean. It will eventually be cryogenic. Um, and uh, actually, uh, breaking news, uh, they succeeded in locking one of the arms of their, of their interferometer uh, to the primary laser um, just a few days ago. And so um, we're very hopeful that Kaga will join uh, the next uh, observing run of LIGO and Virgo. And then, uh, most importantly, LIGO India, um, uh, the, the next uh, member of the International Network of Gravitational Light Detectors, uh, is, is, is under construction. Um, so by having a network of gravitational wave detectors, um, we can firstly um, be confident when we've, that we've detected a, a signal when we have a candidate because we can look for coincidences between multiple sites. And secondly, we can use the differences in time, phase, and, arri phase and amplitude on arrival at all of these sites in order to deduce the direction on the sky and the distance of the source. The localization accuracy that, we're, we, that we were able to achieve in our first observing run, which in which we just had, the, had two detectors, LIGO Livingston and LIGO Hanford, was very poor. Um, these are three of those localizations. They're basically arcs that cross over the, almost the entire sky. Um, and each of these, span, each of these spans uh, several hundred to a thousand square degrees on the sky. So very, very challenging for follow-up. Um, uh, once we, when, when uh, Advanced Virgo came online uh, in uh, June of 2017, uh, our, our localization suddenly got an order of magnitude better because we had an, an additional baseline. Um, and so we went from 1,000 square degrees to only tens of square degrees. Um, and uh, that is part of, uh, that is one of the many things uh, that has enabled 
uh, this, this era of multi-messenger astronomy. And an, a bad analogy for how we do localization is triangulation. We have multiple sites, we measure the time delays that we receive the signal between different detectors, and then we can uh, look, at, look, at the, look for the intersection between uh, triangulation annuli to deduce, to deduce the spot on the sky. Um, the reason that this is a bad analogy is because, is, is because the arrival time is just one of several observables that we have at our disposal in order to, to work out sky location. And it would be a huge waste to build multi-million dollar facilities and, and skimp on how we do localization. So a much better analogy is that, um, is that uh, gra gravitational wave localization is like radio interferometry. So um, localization with LIGO and Virgo works a lot like uh, trying to build up an image or pinpoint a source using a phased array of, ante of, of, of antennas. So in a sense, the gravitational wave detector network is an, in is an interferometer of interferometers. The detectors use laser interferometry and the network as a whole uses interferometry of the gravitational wave strain to work out position on the sky. Much like a, a, a collection of, of simple dipole radio antennas, um, our gravitational wave antennas uh, can sense two orthogonal polarizations. In the case of light, that's horizontal and vertical. In the case of gravitational waves, that's plus and cross. So the plus polarization distorts space-time by stretching it in one direction and squeezing it in the opposite direction. And, and the uh, orthogonal cross polarization looks exactly the same, but it's rotated by 45 degrees. Both the sources that we're looking for, um, in, in, um, the case of, uh, in the case of the sources that we've detected so far, compact binaries, um, as well as our antennas, have uh, known radiation patterns so in, in um, so uh, and, and I'll show what those look like uh, in on the next slide uh, uh, in a few slides, um, and so we can use those known radiation patterns to eliminate directions in the sky where um, where, where there's no sensitivity, um, and uh, we can use the relative times, phases, and amplitudes on arrival um, combined with the relative positions on the Earth and the relative orientations of the detectors. Um, and so we, we sort of phase up this network of detectors for each direction on the sky um, and compare the response of the network to the data that we actually observed. Um, so the one place where this analogy with radio interferometry breaks down um, is that um, is, is the antenna patterns. So gravitational waves are, are quadrupolar, and so they have, um, they have, these, they have different antenna patterns and, and different um, radiation patterns. So the, the, the plus pattern uh, looks like this. So we have the most, so, so the orientation of this, uh, this drawing um, has the arms of the detectors in this mid-plane, so they're, they're like this, and so this direction is perpendicular to the direction of the arms. So we have the greatest sensitivity immediately below, above and immediately below the detector. And um, we have, and anywhere except right above and right below the detector, we have null sensitivity, zero sensitivity, um, at 45 degree angles to the arms. Um, the cross antenna pattern looks similar, except it's rot rotated by 45 degrees, and we also have zero sensitivity for all polarizations um, in the plane of the detector's arms. Um, so aside from that de detail of you know, the antenna patterns, the math is exactly the same as, as uh, um, passive radio localization. So at another detail for compact binaries is that we know this, the, the signal waveform so accurately um, uh, because of, because of we, we model it with general relativity, that we don't actually have to look at the whole data. We just look at the projection of, of the data stream onto a template waveform. And that's match filtering. It's called match filtering. So, I'll, I'll, so um, August 17th event is an instructive example because uh, we actually had to use the antenna patterns um, 
uh, in a uh, very explicit way to get the localization. Um, so uh, on August 17th, we saw this beautiful uh, in-spiral chirp, um, and we knew right away that we'd seen a binary neutron star merger because of the characteristic frequency evolution. Um, there was this huge glitch in the Livingston data caused by a satur saturation of a photodiode. This is, among, this is one of the worst glitches that we've ever um, uh, encountered in data that we've marked as science quality. Nonetheless, we were able to uh, model the glitch and subtract it out, and we got this nice clean chirp in Livingston as well, but there was no signal at all in Virgo, um, or no signal that you could see in this, in this spectrogram. Um, but it turns out that that lack of a signal was very informative for the localization. So this, uh, so now I'm showing you a color map of the LIGO-Hanford antenna pattern, uh, and this is a, a, a heat map of the Livingston antenna pattern, bright where we have good sensitivity, dark when we, where we don't, and this is the triangulation ring between Hanford and Livingston. Here's the localization using Hanford and Livingston. Whoops, that went a little too fast, sorry. There we go, so here we have the triangulation between Hanford and Livingston, so that's a ring. Here's the 90% localization region with regions cut out for where we don't have good sense, where, for, um, where we didn't have amplitude, geez, <laughs> uh, consistency. And as we move this hypothetical position of the source uh, along that triangulation ring, and we compare the observed um, uh, signal to noise ratio with the, signal, with, with the response of the detector at that location, we only find a good match in this much smaller region of 30 square degrees. Um, and that's because uh, Virgo had, had this sensitivity null right here, which cut out a lot of the sky. Okay, so we, ha we have a number of actual implementations of the, the localization. Um, so we have uh, two uh, algorithms that we use for unmuddled burst signals and uh, two algorithms that we use for compact binary mergers. Um, and then uh, two of those are low latency, and so they take a few minutes, and two of those are high latency but uh, incorporate a lot of additional uh, physics and, and details about the detector and take hours to days. Um, and so um, if you plot, you know, speed versus, you know, how uh, model dependent the algorithm is, they're arranged like this. Um, and Basically, they all analyze H of T directly, except for base star, which is our rapid burst, or rapid compact binary localization code, and that only looks at the match filter time series. Um, okay, so how do we measure distance with gravitational waves? Um, so gravitational waves are standard sirens. This is something that uh, was uh, had, was realized a long time ago. It was first pointed out by Bernard Schutz in 1986 that because the uh, luminosity of, the, the gravitational wave luminosity of a, um, of a compact binary merger is only a function of the uh, masses, um, that you could use them as standard sirens in much the sa same way as we use type 1a supernovae as standard candles uh, in order to measure the, the uh, Hubble constant or the expansion rate of the universe. And uh, however, um, there is a degeneracy between the lumin luminosity distance and the inclination angle of the binary's uh, orbit. And that leads to a pronounced Malmquist bias. So we, we tend to observe um, the, the loudest signals predominantly, and the loudest signals are the ones that are more face-on. Um, and it is also the main source of uncertainty in our ability to measure uh, luminosity distance with gravitational waves. So this plot is taken from the, um, the uh, GW170817 source, source properties uh, paper by the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. And this is a um, probability of distribution of the inclination angle versus distance. Um, these two sets of contours are for two different um, sets of prior assumptions about the, um, oh, no, I'm sorry. So, 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 so the blue contours are um, assuming that you don't know anything a priori about the distance, 
and the purple lines are um, if you input the uh, known distance of the uh, of the source from measurements of the host galaxy. Um, so what what you what you can see about these blue contours is that if you only have gravitational wave information, there are there is a range of inclinations that are consistent with different distances. And so if you don't know the you, 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 you need to know the distance of the source in order to tell the inclination, and vice versa. This, this, uh, this degeneracy also uh, translates to um, how well we can measure the Hubble constant. Um, so uh, this is a, these, are con these are probability contours in uh, H0 versus inclination. Um, so, as, so as you can see, if, if we... Um, there's, a range of in, there's a range of inclinations that are supported by the data, and each of those inclinations corresponds to a different value of H0. Um, so uh, as a corollary, if you have another way of measuring the inclination, for example, by modeling the, uh, the spectral energy density evolution of the kilonova or of the afterglow, um, then you can pin down the inclination here, and then you can read off the value of the Hubble constant. Okay, um, so that's so you can use gravitational waves to measure H naught. You can also use gravitational waves uh, to help you find counterparts more efficiently. So um, this is a series of of uh, figures from several papers that looked at different aspects of how you would use a galaxy catalog to uh, to direct where you look for a counterpart. Um, I, the earliest example that I know of of, um, of a paper that you know actually looked at uh, you know seriously looked at um, what uh, you know what this looked like was this this 2013 paper by Nisanka and Kaslawal, um, and then um, there were a number of other papers, including this one and this one that I was on. So. If you have two detectors online, um, then your LIGO localizations look like these long arcs um, in two dimensions. And in three dimensions, if you, uh, um, if you also have the uh, distance as a function of direction on the sky, then they look like these sort of thin potato chips. Um, and uh, I... Uh, they remind me of the seeds of a uh, jacaranda tree. Which, so these are seeds that, when they're exposed to extreme heat, they burst apart and these seeds fly out. So uh, these seed pods are like the gravitational wave localizations, and the seeds inside are like the galaxies. Um, so what you can do is you can take a map of galaxies in the nearby universe, and you can combine that with a three-dimensional localization from LIGO and Virgo, and you can pick out the, the most massive galaxies that are inside that region. And then you can optimize, you can prioritize uh, looking at those galaxies when you're looking for a counterpart. Um, so this worked, th this, this, how well this works depends on how well localized your gravitational wave source is. Um, a lot of gravitational wave events are too poorly localized to use this technique effectively. But now that we have three detectors online, it's more common for this strategy to be fruitful. Um, so GW1717 was, uh, was a case where it was tremendously fruitful. Um, so adding Virgo, you went from this uh, pair of arcs spanning 190 square degrees to this uh, much smaller ellipse, which spanned an area of 30 square degrees. Um, uh, so uh, David Cook, uh, uh, Professor Koslowal, and myself um, took uh, the Census of the Local Universe catalog, and we combined that with this localization, and we um, and we found that so 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 this this Census of the Local Universe catalog has, among other um, things. Uh, estimates of the uh, stellar mass in, in each galaxy. 
and um, NGC4993, which is the host of the, of, of the event, was the third most massive in, uh, in the galaxy in the LIGO localization. And a priori, um, before, e even before doing any follow-up, um, if, you, if you just assume that, if you just rank the galaxies by stellar mass times the gravitational wave posterior probability density, then this was the most likely host. So in the case of this event, it was, it was found simultaneously by a number of facilities that were doing tiled searches of the whole localization, and also by several groups that were pinpointing individual galaxies. Um, so another thing that you can do is that you can, uh, if, if you combine a galaxy catalog with gravitational wave observations, is that you can, um, you can measure the redshift of the, uh, of the host galaxy in a statistical sense. So um, this is a, a, hist this is a uh, histogram of uh, the, of the redshift and luminosity di distance of all galaxies in a specific catalog. Um, and then um, if you have just the Hanford-Livingston localization and you multiply that localization by this galaxy catalog, then it picks out um, a bunch of spikes in, in redshift. So it's, it's as if each galaxy is getting to, um, you know, has a vote about what the redshift is. And um, this is tallying up how many votes uh, each redshift bin got. Um, with the Hanford-Livingston-Virgo localization, you get sort of three pronounced peaks. So these are basically three groups of galaxies. Um, and um, in, if we detected the same source, but with a sensitivity that we expect to have in O3, then we'd almost uh, pick out, we, we, we'd almost pick out the correct redshift um, without uh, even having to find a counterpart. So this is just to demonstrate um, that you can use a galaxy catalog to learn properties of learn about properties of the host. If you naturally, if you have a counterpart, um, then you then you then you know the host galaxy and you can find out the redshift. But if but in the case of a uh, binary black hole merger where you don't expect to find a counterpart, then you can use these same techniques to to statistically measure the redshift um, and use binary black hole mergers to do cosmology even though you don't have a counterpart. So like I said, um, which, which approach you use, whether you tile the whole localization, or thank you, or whether you uh, target individual galaxies, um, is a function of how well localized the source is. So um, we can, uh, so I've done a simulation of, of uh, compact bi binary mergers in O3, and I, for each simulation I've I've localized the source and I've calculated the 50% uh, credible volume. So this is the so this is the volume in cubic megaparsecs of the region to which we've, you know, reconstructed the position of the source, um, and that uh, translates to um, the number of galaxies, assuming um, a certain average density of galaxies. And so what you find is is that um, for binary neutron star mergers in O3, about half the time uh, a galaxy targeted strategy will work very well, and about half the time a synoptic survey strategy or, or a, you know, a tiling strategy will work well. My last couple slides are just about how, we actually, how, how these localizations are actually stored. So LIGO Virgo sky maps are stored in FITS files, uh, so it's the same format that is used for most images and spectra in astronomy, um, but there's an important difference. Um, instead of being stored as a two-dimensional image, they're stored as a one-dimensional array, and uh, that array is a Helpix table. Helpix stands for Hierarchical Equal Area Pixelization, so it's a way of taking the unit sphere and dividing it into tiles where each tile has the same area. Um, there are several different resolutions that are supported by Helpix, and as you go from each resolution to the next finer resolution, you just subdivide the existing tiles. Um, so that's the hierarchical part. 
Um, so our FITS files contain four columns. Prob, which is the probability. So it's, it's just the probability on the sky, and it sums to one. You don't have to include a, you know, a, a, a pixel area, because the, the pixels all have the same area. And then the uh, distance estimate, as a function of direction on the sky, is stored as a location, scale, and normalization parameter. So, uh, so in each direction on the sky, we have prob, which, which, um, for which we use the, the symbol rho, and we have these three uh, distance parameters. So we assume that the uh, distance distribution on a, at a given line of sight is given by a Gaussian times r squared. And the location and scale parameters uh, of that Gaussian are given by mu and sigma. So these are not, these are kind of like mean and standard deviation, but they're not exactly the same as mean and standard de deviation because of this r squared factor and, and because the Gaussian is truncated at the origin. Um, so the, if we want to write down the probability, the 3D probability density, um, we just take the conditional distance, distance distribution and multiply by rho. Lastly, um, if we want the prob probability density per unit volume, then we have to divide uh, dp by dv. So dv is just 4 pi r squared dr divided by the number of heel picks pixels. Um, so when we do that, uh, the r squared from the uh, conditional distance distribution and the r squared from the volume element cancel. Um, so that's just something to be careful about. You have to be careful whether you're working in spherical coordinates or Cartesian coordinates, and that determines whether or not you have the, the, the factor r squared hanging around. Lastly, um, there's, uh, I've put together a, um, a user guide for LIGO Virgo public alerts. So this is uh, not, this is a, 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 ref, a, a document that, um, that the LIGO scientific collaboration has put out um, that goes through um, the process of uh, signing up for LIGO Virgo alerts, uh, pulling the sky maps out of them, and, um, how, and it goes through how to use the sky maps. So a lot of the material and the tutorial that we're about to go to um, is taken from this document. With that, I'll stop and ask for questions before we switch to Python. Go ahead. That's right. So in the first observing run, we just had LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston, and we, we, um, we, we, we call those the, the H and the L detectors, and then we had Virgo, which is V. Um, we'll detect more sources out to greater distance. Yeah. Yeah, so, the, so, the, so what's, what's changing is that each of the detectors is getting more sensitive. Um, and also, we expect to get a, th a fourth detector, Kagra, um, at some point late in the observing run, although its sensitivity will be significantly less than the other three detectors. Did that answer your question? Um, the, the, the median localization will be the same because the detectors are all improving by the same, uh, by the same ratio. The difference is that at the typical source that we detect will be further away. Um, for, for a source at a given distance, yes, we'll, it'll, we'll, we'll be able to act, localize it more accurately. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the question is how do we, how can we use electromagnetic observations to improve the localization? And that's actually, um, if we go back to this slide, um, so we have two non-gravitational wave, well, we have three electromagnetic localizations on here. We have the uh, GBM, Fermi GBM localization. Um, we have the um, Earth occultation const constraint from AstroSat. And we have the interplanetary network triangulation between Fermi and Interval, I believe. And so if, we'd, if we hadn't had um, Virgo online, then we still would have been able to cut away a lot of this um, using the gamma ray observations. 
Um, now, so that so so we can combine gra we can certainly combine gravitational wave and and gamma ray observations when we have a GRB, but um, if once we find a counterpart, we know the position very accurately, and we also know the redshift. Um, so if we if we assume that we know what the Hubble constant is, then we can then we can also uh, determine the inclination angle from gravitational waves. Public, completely public. Yes. As well as what? Yes, everyone will get the the public alerts at the same time. Yeah. Yes. So there is some upper limit to the isotropic energy increase. So for this uh, merging events also, if we have some limit of the gravitational energy increase, then there will be some limit to the distance where we can observe it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So is that uh, there is some upper limit and we Actually, I that's a that's a good question. I don't know which is so. So, okay. Well, is your question? Are we limited in when we're looking for coincidences between GRBs and gravitational wave events? Whether we're limited by the sensitivity of gamma ray detectors or the sensitivity of gravitational wave detectors? Is that the question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. So so there's so we can detect sources out to well okay. Um so in for example in um in O2 we could detect sources to an average range of 60 or 70 megaparsecs. Um, but um, the maximum distance to which we could see a source that was optimally aligned, you know, the inclination, you know, we were looking at the, at the orbit face on, was two point, a factor of 2.26 times that. So it was, you know, something like 150, 160. Um, um, gravitational waves are so so, right. So the 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 Malmquist bias is much more pronounced for GRBs than it is for gravitational wave sources. Yeah. So so, it's we, normally people assume that when you're looking at a gamma ray burst, the jet drops off to zero emission at, at, at some finite distance from the, the, you know, the, the center of the jet. But in gravitational waves, we get, we get, uh, I mean, we get emission at all angles. Um, it's just that it's a maximum when it's face on. Um, yeah, so it's, um, that's, yeah. Did, did, did that answer your, your question? Okay. okay. Go ahead. Oh, keep. Uh, okay. All right. So we got to switch to Python and um, just come, just come at, come uh, ask questions after the end of the session. 
So first we need, um, uh, we'll use um, a function from astropy.utils.data. Um, we'll need pi, uh, sorry, matplotlib, numpy, and healpy. Oh, here's another um, uh, Python thing. Uh, when you import a module, you can uh, tell it, you can tell Python how you want to access that module by importing it as some name. Um, and so you'll very, whenever you see code that uses matplotlib or numpy, you'll very frequently see it imported as plt and np respectively, and that's the convention that's used in the uh, numpy and matplotlib documentation, so I tend to follow that. Um, we run, let's run that cell. Um, uh, Dave um, had some additional imports for the galaxy cross matching material. So we're gonna run those up front as well. And then lastly, uh, we want to um, configure matplotlib to send plot output directly to the notebook. And I guess right here, it's good to just check that that is working. So let's all um, just make a, a toy plot here. Um, so, uh, and we'll pick up a little bit of uh, NumPy um, library stuff along the way. So, oh, by the way, right, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing the, tutor, the, the tutors saying, when I execute a cell, what I'm doing is, while I have it highlighted, I press Shift, Enter. Um, so t equals numpy.linspace 0 to pi. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there, that's a good question. Um, so there are a couple ways to do that. You can go to, oh, and I'm using, ah, I'm using JupyterLab, not, yeah. So, oh, thank you. Yeah, so the plus, you can also go edit. Um, uh, there's a, should be a insert cell below somewhere. Um, but there's also a shortcut and um, so if you type control M A, that means insert cell above. And you, if you type control M B, that's insert cell below. Raise your hand if you don't have a sinusoid and you need help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's very confusing. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to assume now that at least everyone is sitting next to someone who has a sinusoid on, in their notebook. All right. Um, so now we're going to um, do, we're going to, um, look at some basics uh, with heel, heel picks. Um, so I know that uh, a lot of people had trouble installing heel pie and um, uh, uh, part of the issue would, could be that heel pie doesn't support Windows at all. Um, uh, so if you're on Windows, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you're on Windows, please use Yes, yes. So HillPy is correct when it's stored on Docker. Yeah. So actually, sorry for that I said you don't need it. If you have a Windows system, please do start Docker. Uh, does anyone need any uh, any help with that right now? No. That is a component. So a lot, of, a lot of these examples, though, that use HillPy, there's another Python um, package called AstroPy HillPix. And I'll just go over to that page, and you can install it with pip. Um, so this, this package is a little bit easier to install, um, but it includes a lot of the same functionality, and it actually has an, inter inter an interface that is compatible with HealPy. And so um, something to try later if you have trouble with HealPy, you can try doing pip install AstroPy HealPix, and then you can do from AstroPy heel picks import heel pie as HP. Okay. So 
First, we're going to download a localization. Uh, we're going to start off by playing with a, um, a FITS file that's part of the um, uh, LIGO Virgo user guide. The easiest way to download it would be using curl, um, but um, AstroPy has this um, handy function, astropy.utils.data.download file, um, so we don't have to leave Python to download something. Um, so we put in the URL, URL there, and then we download it, and it returns a file name. Okay. Um, now to read a uh, Helpix file, we use helpy.readmap. And to take a first quick look at what that uh, file looks like, we use helpy.mallview. So it's, it plots a mallweed projection of the file um, into the notebook. Now, if we actually look at what, um, what prob is, uh, it's a one-dimensional uh, NumPy array. And uh, so how does this translate to a two-dimensional image? Well, Helpix um, is a way, like, as I said in the presentation, it's a, it allows you to index regions on the sphere using integers. Um, so to decode a Helpix pixel index, you need two pieces of information. You need to know the resolution of the Helpix map, and you need to know the pixel index. So, the uh, it so in, in code that uses Helpy, you'll often see npix written to um, express the length of a Helpix array, and n side, which is the lateral resolution. So every Helpix image starts by dividing up the the unit sphere into twelve base tiles, and n side is the number of subdivisions along each side of those base tiles. So the number of pixels is 12 times n side squared. And there are, uh, there are heel pi functions called n pix to n side and n side to n pix to convert between length and resolution and vice versa. Um, so first of all, we get the length of that uh, heel pix array using the built-in Python function len. And we save that in the variable npix, and then we'll need to convert that to n side using npix to n side, and we'll need to have n side around for any heel pi function that we call. Um, to uh, so heel pi also provides all the functions that we need to convert between pixel index and right ascension and declination. Um, so the, we'll start with the function hp.pix to ang. So this converts from pixel to right ascension declination. Now by default, these return physics spherical coordinates. So um, if so by default, they give you uh, the colatitude theta and the longitude phi in radians. Um, but you can switch to astronomy spherical coordinates, which would be the uh, right ascension in degrees and the declination in degrees. Uh, by passing the keyword argument lon lat equals true. Um, so let's start by just looking up the right ascension and declination of pixel 123. Um, so pix to ang returns us a tuple of the right ascension and declination. The ang to pix function does the opposite. So we give it a right ascension de declination and it gives us the pixel index. Okay, so um, what is the most probable sky location? Um, well, you, you, all you have to do is you have to find the index of the maximum value in the heel pix array and then find its right ascension and declination. Um, so uh, there's a built-in function called in, in NumPy called argmax which gives you the index of the maximum value in an array. So that's this number, and then we convert that to a right ascension and declination. Okay, any questions? Go ahead. Oh, this is, well, it's, um, it's probability. So it's, um, uh, 
So, so remember that the heel picks array sums to one. We can check that. All right, so it sums to one. And so um, the units are going to be kind of arbitrary because it's, probab it's probability density times four pi over n picks. Yeah. Any other questions? Exactly. The only, the, the, um, the, um, there's some stuff in the header that's, that, that can be important, like a heel picks array could be in equatorial or galactic coordinates, but, um, and actually, almost all heel picks maps that you encounter in astronomy will be in galactic coordinates because they're mostly CMB maps, and the, the one exception is LIGO Virgo maps, which are always equatorial. Uh, in the back? Oh. Oh, same question? Good. Okay. Um, so as an exercise, um, I, let's, um, uh, let's calculate the, um, the probability that the, that the source is above a right, asc right ascension of 15 degrees. I'm oh, sorry, above a declination of 15 degrees. So we're going to have to, oh, okay. This is going to involve a little bit extra NumPy. No, not necessarily. Okay, so we start by um, creating a, we, we start by enumerating all the pixels on the sky. So this function uh, numpy dot a range um, works just like the Python's built-in range function, except that it returns a numpy array. Um, then we're going to convert all of those pixels to right ascension and declination. And that's for you to fill in. And then we're going to, so <coughs> we're going to calculate the sum of the elements of the heel picks array, and we have to fill in the indices. So let's um, let's take a minute and try to do that. Go ahead. Can fix drag and vice versa handle arrays? Yes. Yep. Um, heel pi will want it to be in either degrees or radians. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start filling in some parts of this. Okay, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna fill this in. Um, uh, so, um, so what's the first argument? N side, yeah. What's the next argument? Hypix. 
Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what do I need to put in here? Yeah. That greater than 15. Okay. So there's a 40% probability, well, 39.4% probability that the source is above a declination of 15 degrees. So the next section is. Un well, so unfortunately, it uses a lot of matplotlib stuff, and we haven't done that much with matplotlib. But the idea here is that we're going to play around with uh, scipy.stats. Um, so scipy is so so the so remember uh, there 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 are sort of a bunch of um, scientific Python libraries that you always want to have on hand, and so there's NumPy for vector math. Matplotlib for visualization, and then there's SciPy for special functions, uh, statistics, um, and uh, many, many generically useful scientific computing algorithms. Um, so we're going to use SciPy.stats here, and we're going to need um, we're, we're going to need it because we need to be able to evaluate probability distribution functions in order to calculate. Um, Distance statistics from our FITS file. Um, so, um, so in this this example, we have a t distribution um, with three degrees of freedom, and we're going to plot it. So, um, you can so so when you when you call scipy.stats.t, it gives you a distribution object, and then that distribution object has uh, a method called PDF that gives you the probability distribution function. Um, then we're also going to, uh, we also have the CDF, the cumulative distribution function, which is the integral um, from minus infinity to a given value. And we'll plot that as well. Um, so, um, as an exercise, let's um, let's take a normal distribution um, with a m m with a location value of ten and a uh, scale parameter of three, and we'll make our distribution object. Okay. Okay, and so just take a minute there to um, get a distribution object and to plot the PDF and CDF. Right, yeah, so um, that's a good question. So, um, so you, can, you, can, you can sort of use these distribution objects in two different ways. You can, so if you pass it enough arguments to um, describe a particular instance of the distribution, um, then it becomes frozen. 
So the, those, those, so in this case, the mean and standard deviation get baked into the object. And then you can call the PDF, the CDF, so on and so forth. However, you can also use it in this way, where you use the distribution object itself. Um, and then you pass in the um, location and scale parameters as additional arguments to the PDF or the CDF or whatever you like. Yeah, I find that style confusing though, so I tend to I tend to use the frozen version. Okay, so for um, for our plot, when we call linspace, we just need to pass it a large enough range that it um, in, that in, it encloses the peak of our distribution, which is going to be at 10. Um, by the way, this function, np.linspace, uh, gives you a grid of regularly spaced values between the its two arguments, inclusive. Um, then to plot them, we just do that. And there we go. All right. Any questions about any more questions about distributions or um, anything? Anyone still having trouble with the heel picks stuff earlier? Go ahead. Ah, yeah. Oh, I did. Yeah, I did delete it. I'm sorry. So the the point is that um, you can you can think of norm. As a, func as a function that returns normal distributions, um, like that. Or you can think of uh, norm as the standard normal distribution. Okay, so in fact, um, if you don't give it any location and scale parameters, It'll just be a standard zero mean unit variance normal mean no, no, normal distribution, um, but uh, you can also inst instead of you know creating a distribution object with specific values of all the parameters, you can also pass in um, the additional parameters as arguments to PDF or CDF, so on and so forth. Um, and so that that was the that was the line that I deleted, but I find I find this style very confusing personally because I always it's hard for me to remember which of these numbers is x, you know which of these values is the is is where I'm evaluating the PDF and which of these are the mean and standard deviation. So I I, I don't like using that. All right, so now we're going to actually play around with some 3D localizations. Um, and so um, we're going to use a different sky map this time. Um, and actually, um, so similarly, this is just a URL. It, this, this happens to be a URL in the uh, LIGO Document Control Center. And this is um, a repository, Th this particular document is a repository of several FITS files. Um, so we've got to wait for it to download. And actually, one second here, I don't remember which event this is. So don't ignore what I'm doing right here. Okay, yeah, so this is 1708.17. 
OK. Um, so we're going to use, so now, so now that we've downloaded it, we're going to read it with um, heelpy.readmap. Um, but we're going to have to pass it an additional argument to tell it that we want all four, we, we want certain <laughs> columns to come out of the file. And so um, there, remember there are, there are four columns, prob, dist mu, uh, dist sigma, and dist norm, and we want all four of them. Um, so we'll call read map, and we'll use uh, tuple unpacking to store each of those arrays on the command line. Uh, or sorry, on, in, in a separate variable rather, excuse me. And then we'll also need to get n picks, n side, and also the area per pixel in steradians. So that'll take a second to run because it's unzipping the file and takes a second. Okay, now it's done. Okay, next let's plot the distance distribution um, in the direction of the that is most likely. So we get the maximum pixel using argmax of prob, and then we can and um, we can convert that to right ascension and declination, although we don't actually need to know the right ascension and declination. Okay. We'll need a distance array that runs from, say, 0 to 70. And then we need to um, evaluate the PDF. And um, then we need to plot R versus the PDF. OK, so, um, so we know I picks max. Um, so the um, sorry, the, so dist mu at the maximum, at the, at the most probable pixel is, we just use um, uh, array indexing. Okay, and so now let's fill in the expression for the PDF. So remember, this is a this is going to be a Gaussian with um, uh, times r squared times uh, dist mu. So I'll take a, a minute to let people try and do that. Oh, what value is IPix max? You get a different number? Or no? Okay.
Okay, so I filled in the answer here. Um, so, so we have our Gaussian here. So we have so the location and scale parameters are dist mu and dist sigma, and we evaluate the PDF at r, and we also have to multiply by r squared and by dist norm. And so you should get something like this that has a peak at about 40 megaparsecs. Okay, any questions about that? Go ahead. When you're trying to read the, the It's getting stuck here. Ah, yeah. Yeah, so, oh, it's too big. Ah, okay. We're all doing it at the same time, which doesn't quite Um. This is in Docker or? So did you tell me, so this is a query that we're doing now online anyway, right? Yes. Well, so. So is it getting stuck downloading or is it getting stuck yeah. reading it? Okay. So another another thing you can do there should be a there should be a copy of this in. Um, come on, no. What are you doing? Hang on. There we go. There you go. So there's a local copy of this inside the Docker image. So if you write that, then that should work. How do you kill it? Hit the hit the stop button right there. Okay. So we I, I'm thinking we better like give people a minute or two to get back to to to, to fix this. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, there's there's a technical wrinkle that is causing a problem for a lot of people that this that the the seventeen oh eight seventeen sky map is really high resolution, and when you decompress it, it it's actually um, it's it's causing some trouble for, for some people because it it expands to a few gigabytes in memory. Um, so the the example file that we were working with before. Um, from the user guide does, is a much smaller file. So if you're having trouble, use that one instead. So if you go back up to the notebook, uh, in the notebook, to where we downloaded the sample event from the user guide, the, the, the cell that has a URL that looks like emfollow.docs.liga.org, just execute that cell and then scroll back down to where we are working with the um, uh, distance maps, which is here. And starting from that cell, just execute that. So it's going to be a much smaller file. OK? Um, and we can go through the same exercise as before. All the numbers will change because it's a different sky map. Um, and uh, it's probably need to change the um, the scale of the distance plot, for example. But that's okay. Um, okay. So since we only have a few minutes left, I'm going to simplify the galaxy cross matching material quite a bit. Um, so some of the some of the material in this in this notebook goes through computing stellar masses and and ranking by stellar mass and so on and so forth, but I'm just going to go through selecting galaxies that uh, ranking the galaxies by uh, most probable to least probable. Um, so there's a a um, galaxy catalog um, that comes in the Docker image, and you're going to read it using the AstroPy table 
uh, module, which we already which we imported at the top. And when you read it um, and display it, you can look through the columns here. Each each item ha will have a name, a right ascension, a declination, uh, a distance modulus, um, and it'll have yeah. There we go. There's a distance in megaparsecs. Um, so now AstroPy tables, you can use um, a lot of the same, they, they behave a lot like NumPy arrays, except that you can index them by uh, the name of a column, or you can index them by uh, the row number, or by both. Okay, so um, what we're going to do now, oops, sorry about that, is we are going to um, calculate the probability density for each galaxy. Um, so that's, so, um, uh, so we start out by, um, uh, calling ang two picks so now we have the hill picks pixel of each galaxy and then we're going to um, evaluate the probability density for each pixel so that's going to be um, um, scipy.stats.pdf um, uh, or sorry scipy.stats.norm uh, distmu ipix dist sigma ipix dot pdf clue dist mpc times disnorm ipix times um, prob ipix times um, npix over um, four pi. Okay, so let's. Um, I'm going to break that into a few lines to make it more readable. Oops. Okay, so let's. So line by line, we have the. So remember, when you want probability density per the r squared cancels out. Um, so there's so there's no r squared here, um, and so this first line is the conditional distance distribution evaluated at, evaluated at the pixel that contains each galaxy, or sorry, with, with the sorry with the distance mean and standard deviation from the pixel con that contains each galaxy evaluated at that galaxy's distance. Um, we have to multiply by the distance normalization factor, the 2D probability on the sky, and we have to multiply by, well, we have to divide by the uh, pixel area, um, uh, which is 4 pi over n picks. And then we're going to store this in the table as dp dv. Okay. Okay. 
Now, if we simply sort the table by dp dv, and then we reverse it, then we have the list of galaxies ranked by descending posterior probability density. Reverse um, reverses the array in place. Sort sorts the array in place by the column that you tell it. And we can we can plot just certain columns to make it more readable. And check that it actually is in descending order. Yep. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear who was speak. Do, did someone ask a question? I just no. Okay. So the other the other material in this tutorial um, that we didn't go through is so some of it uses. Um, LIGO.SkyMap, which is a um, package that I wrote that includes some fancy plotting stuff. So um, uh, it allows you to um, make pretty sky maps like this one, where um, you can take a Helpix image and you can throw it on um, uh, a whatever projection that you like. Um, and it also goes through um, some code that um, that Dave wrote to calculate the um, stellar mass of each galaxy, which is which is traced by uh, the mid infrared luminosity, um, and then uh, rank the sources by that. Um, and then the outcome, the final outcome, if you if you're able to load the GW170817 sky map, is that uh, NGC4993 should be in the top three, and that's that's kind of uh, the end of the material for this uh, for this tutorial. Thank you.